girls should play with dolls boys should play with trucks boys should wear blue and green girls will wear pink and red this is a conditioning from birth hello ladies and gentlemen welcome uh, to our second annual international women's day webinar my name is sunita vyas and i'm the co-convener at canada india foundation Following up on our last year's International Women's Day webinar, we are pleased to bring to you another power-packed interactive discussion on a topic that is very close to our heart, break the bias. Before we start today's discussion, here are some key insights I discovered which will set the mood for our discussion today. News from 2019 newspaper Mirror, and hold it, it's from 2019, states that NASA acts its first all-female spacewalk as the International Space Station did not have enough suits for women at that time. We are talking 2019. I'm sure most of you know that women earn 82 cents for every dollar that a man earns. Women of color, far worse. Black women earn 62 cents on the dollar, Hispanic 54 cents. 35% chances of a Caucasian applicant being given a call back for employment compared to 11% for a person of color. World Economic Forum data shows 57% of women have experienced gender discrimination, while 73% say they haven't. What a number. In Canada, only 15.6 companies are owned by women. Well, there's a brighter side, right? There's always a brighter side. Research by McKinsey and Company found that gender diverse companies outperform their national average on a regular basis. Another study shows that firms with women in management position enjoy 35% more return on equity than firms that lack gender diversity. Today, we are fortunate to have some eminent ladies as panelists, women who have continuously broken the glass ceiling and continue to inspire and break biases every day of their lives. Getting our show for the night moving, I would like to request our chair at Canada India Foundation, Mr. Satish Thakkar, to please come forward to introduce our guest of honor and keynote speaker, Mrs. Apurva Srivastavaji, Council General of India. Satish Ji, welcome. Uh, thank you so very much, uh, Sunita, and a very good evening <laughs> to everyone. Uh, today, we are all uh, gathered here to celebrate a very, very uh, important day as we are uh, marking and celebrating this International uh, Woman Day. Uh, last year, we took this initiative to uh, celebrate and uh, with the able leadership of our woman uh, national co-convener Sarita Vyas along with the, uh, her team members we had uh, Ves Sarma and uh, Ahima Bhatt and also Indira. So we celebrated that last year event which we got very very good compliments and uh, this, year, this year again we are <clears throat> celebrating uh, this event and uh, we are very happy that we are making this as a part of our uh, annual calendar for CIF that every year we should and we must uh, celebrate this uh, moving forward and we have very accomplished uh, panelists today. Uh, friends, as we are celebrating and marking the uh, you know glory of womanhood, womanhood and it's not not a kind of a uh, you know unknown topic to us if we go back to the centuries and uh, i would say time immemorial that the womanhood is being regarded well respected and even being uh, you know kind of a uh, elevated to to the level of uh, divine in our vedic uh, scriptures we see the power wisdom and wealth is being represented by three goddesses, right? The goddess of wealth is Lakshmi. The goddess of power is Ma Shakti Durga. And the goddess of wisdom, Ma Saraswati. And also, if we look at it in our Vedic uh, scripture, one way, very, very famous uh, hymn, which says, Yatra Naryastu Pujyante Ramante Tatra Devata, means wherever the women are respected, regarded, and worshipped. Divine energy blossoms there. So it's, it's a, uh, you know, over the centuries, over the course of times, 
we have seen that we are cherishing and we always uh, enriching enriching our lives with the accomplishment of the woman be it any endeavor of human in in the battlefield to leading a state to running a corporate to managing the household it's we see women everywhere uh, leading through their heart and soul and with a kind of an iron will and we see millions and millions of an examples over over the over the centuries which are there to inspire us and uh, today's topic which is break the bias which have, we have been seeing over the century that women coming forward in breaking the bias and we are looking forward to very very interactive uh, discussion today and very inspiring discussion of course our uh, speakers our panelists are who have touched the pinnacle of uh, success to their their individual uh, endeavors and breaking the biases and we are looking forward to this very very inspiring uh, discussion and thank you rahul for agreeing to moderate uh, this session uh, uh, this evening and before we begin uh, that formal discussion i would like to invite a very um, our dear friend of canada india foundation uh, ms apurva shrivastava current consul general of india in toronto uh, she is a, a great friend of canada india foundation and she herself uh, ep uh, epitomizes the you know the skills the talent the the power and the courage of 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 uh, womanhood and she has been a great uh, ambassador of india uh, in in toronto we are very very blessed to have uh, have her here uh, representing india and with over two decades of uh, uh, excellent experience in uh, representing at various uh, uh, missions and uh, uh, working with ministry of external affairs as well as uh, at sark Uh, we are very fortunate that uh, uh, she has been with us for the last almost three, three years now. Out of that, two years were uh, throughout the COVID. But the activity she led, even during the COVID period, it's very, very admirable and very inspiring. And uh, uh, Madam Shrivastava, we are very fortunate and very uh, honored to have you with us. And uh, we're looking forward to your brief comments. Over to you. Namaskar. Thank you, Satish ji, for these lovely words. And uh, first of all, greetings to all of you for on the occasion of International Women Day. Uh, let me begin by thanking Canada India Foundation for inviting me for this event, along with such eminent panelists. I'm really honored to be here amongst all of you. Uh, uh, so, as Satish ji said, that in Indian tradition, women are believed to be an incarnation of Shakti, the goddess of power, and uh, and truly so. we believe that only empowered women uh, can create an empowered society and a strong nation india has produced remarkable women of great strength and fortitude uh, who have shaped its destiny and are still doing so uh, women contributed immensely during the freedom struggle and has been an equal partner of india's development since then i am very proud to say that india is a country where a women have became a president a prime minister chief ministers of different states heads of political parties and speakers of house of parliament and women have held uh, top positions in every field be it sports business film industry both as actors as directors being entrepreneurs scientists mountaineers doctors name it and uh, women are at its helm leading women are now doing well in fields which was uh, once dominated by men like police pilots and combat positions in the army uh, if you had seen this iconic uh, photograph of india's mars mission there was Uh, this is a group of sari clad ladies who were who were the main scientists so this this our mars mission which was so successful was largely helped by women scientists uh, when we look at the data about the percentage of women pilots uh, india has the highest percentage of women pilots in the world so we are leading everywhere we are breaking all barriers they are breaking all shackles and uh, it's great to see uh, you know such uh, successful and wonderful women 
Government also have formed policies to ensure proper representation of women in all fields. Women attained right to vote at the time of India's independence in 1947, at a time when several uh, countries were struggling to do so. Uh, the 33% reservation of women at panchayat at the initial at the council levels uh, is has has you know transformed the position of women in India. Um, uh, you know, we uh, today we have we are the biggest beneficiaries of largest microfinancing schemes of the world. Uh, women are the equal partner and equal contributor to the development process as we undertake as a nation. Uh, the narrative is changing from women's development to women-led development. Uh, I, uh, I would say that there are some certain problems, but we are dealing with it and uh, uh, the way the things are progressing, we look at the brighter side. I, as uh, Satiji has said, I have been in Toronto for a little more than two, uh, two and a half years. Uh, and uh, when, when I uh, discuss today about this topic, breaking the bias, I see such wonderful women who have been breaking, breaking the bias and uh, are successful all across uh, uh, in the Canadian, uh, in, in Canada, uh, a lot of women from, uh, from Indian heritage. So I would like to take this opportunity to congratulate all of you for your extraordinary journeys. I know many of you have come from India, started from scratch, and now you are running uh, business, holding professional positions, bringing up your kids, just with your grit, uh, determination, and perseverance. Uh, today, we are here to celebrate all these achievements, uh, but uh, this celebration should not be limited to one day. Every day is a day for women, and we should celebrate ourselves throughout the year, you know, just by trying to improve a little every day, by supporting and encouraging each other, and by being ambitious, uh, fierce, and flawed. Uh, women must also have the same freedom as men to make mistakes. You know, the pressure to succeed is greater on women leaders. And they are subject to greater scrutiny and feel obliged, obliged to you know, get it right every time. Uh, I would also like to acknowledge the role of men you know, in, in the success of the women, the role uh, you, you, our fathers, our brothers, our husbands, and our sons have played in, 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 our, in shaping our personality. So definitely you know, for, any, for breaking the bias, I think the role of men is equally important. Uh, so I know, uh, so I'll conclude by saying that, you know, let's make mistakes, let's learn from our mistakes, let's celebrate each other's achievement. Let us endeavor to create a world together where all women can be best versions of themselves, uh, where there is no glass ceilings to shatter and no glass slippers to fit in. So once again, wish you all a very happy Women's Day and I look forward to for the wonderful discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Apurvaji. Thank you, Satish. Uh, Apurvaji, you're so right. I mean, this has been such an inspiring, um, uh, I mean, uh, keynote speaker that you've been today for us. It really uh, does talk about what women have done in the past. And I to totally feel it that there shouldn't be any glass ceilings that we need to break or any glass slippers that we need to fit. It's something that I'm going to take away today after this uh, meeting that we are the discussion that we have today. A lot of people probably don't even know this, that Mrs. Apurvaji is only the second council general woman in Toronto since 1975. That's a huge feat. She's only the second council general who's a woman since 1975. So we are taking uh, the right steps in the right direction. So without further ado, uh, let's start the program today. I'd like to introduce our moderator for the evening, Mr. Rahul Shastri. Rahul is the managing partner at Kagan Shastri LLP, a boutique land used, uh, a land use development and litigation firm located in the Yorkville area of downtown Toronto. He received a dual U.S. and Canadian law degree in 1990 and has been called to the bar in Ontario, Michigan, and Georgia. He's a member of the Advocate Society and the Canadian Bar Association. Rahul's practice is litigation focused and over his 30 plus years legal career, he's represented a wide array of clients in multiple and varying mandates ranging from real estate, construction disputes to shareholder and boardroom issues. Rahul has authored multiple articles and lectured on matters of interest to the bar. Rahul was formerly a governor at the Holy Trinity School, Richmond Hill, Ontario, and the past national conven convener at the Canada India Foundation. 
In 2012, Rahul was awarded the prestigious Queen's Diamond Jubilee Medal in recognition of his contribution to Canada. Just in a uh, just in disclaimer note, Rahul definitely doesn't look as if he's been in the business for so long. So either Rahul, you're using Botox or you're not telling us your real age. <laughs> Welcome, Rahul. I really don't know how to follow that. <laughs> but thank you for that very warm uh, introduction, Sunita, and, and good evening, uh, one and all. It's great to be with you today to celebrate International Women's Day. Uh, welcome to the panel portion of this evening's Break the Bias program. Um, just to set it up, uh, we have three incredible speakers. Uh, the, the panel portion will be generally a, a roundtable discussion. And, and if at the end of the uh, session there is sufficient time, we will welcome uh, any questions that we may have uh, from uh, the audience. I'd like to welcome the audience and again, glad that you're here with us. Achieving gender equality and empowering women and girls is the unfinished business of our time and the greatest human rights challenge in our world. That was spoken by Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General in his 2018 International Women's Day message. Now, much has happened since 2018, and I'm sure that there have been advances made to promote and to advance gender equality, but we're obviously not there yet because we're discussing it today. This evening, I'm delighted to be joined by three most capable and successful individuals who happen to be women. By the end of this panel, I hope that you will take away some nuggets of wisdom and potential life lessons that each of our esteemed panelists will impart. Without further delay, I'm privileged to introduce each of these fascinating and accomplished women. I'll start with Anju Vermani. Anju Vermani has spent the majority of her business career at CargoJet. She joined the company in 2001 as a founding executive and helped drive the company's impressive trajectory. As Chief Information Officer, he led its technology strategy and customer acquisition efforts, going public in 2007 and growing it into a multi-billion, that's a B, billion <laughs> dollar company. Ms. Vermani serves as a member of the Audit Committee and Innovation and Transformation, Transformation Committee at Ontario Health, and she serves on the Audit and Human Resources and Governments, Governance Committees of the board at the Ontario Power Generation. Her previous appointments include being part of the Advisory Council for National Security, reporting to our then Prime Minister, the Right Honorable Stephen Harper. He's been on the boards of the Toronto Transit Commission and the Toronto Central Local Health Integration Network and the School, School of Business Advisory Committee. In 2021, Ms. Vermani was named as one of Canada's top 100 most powerful women in the category of C-suite executives by the Women's Executive Network. Ms. Vermani, and this is the important part from my perspective, has mentored and invested in entrepreneurial communities for more than two decades, helping women-led entrepreneurial firms in particular to grow their businesses. In 2019, Ms. Vermani launched the Savitri and Anju Vermani Scholarship for Women in STEM with Ryerson University to honor her mother. Over a five-year period, the $200,000 program is providing $10,000 a year to four deserving high potential final year students in STEM program. Congratulations and welcome, Anju. Thank you. Thank you. For Our that. next our next uh, panelist is Priya Patil. Uh, Priya Patil is a senior public company executive and investment banker with international finance and legal expertise and experience spanning over 20 years. She began her career as a technology and finance attorney in Silicon Valley in Palo Alto, California and Toronto, Canada. I'm sure she was in California during the winter. <laughs> Many high-level <laughs> high and prestigious positions. Uh, she was global head of diversified industries at the Toronto Stock Exchange and the TSX Venture Exchange, 
where she primarily advised corporate boards and management teams, as well as pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, and private equity funds on more than 100 IPOs as the stock exchange advisor. As a senior investment banker, Ms. Patil was managing director, partner, and head of investment banking at two national investment banks, PI Financial and Loan Andate McCutcheon. She was the chief legal officer of a NYSE TSE listed multi mine zinc copper producer operating in multiple countries. Ms. Patil currently sits on boards of two resource based public companies, one listed on the Toronto Stock Exchange, Signature Resources, which is a gold mining company, and the other on the London Stock Exchange, Rambler Metals and Mining, a copper producing company. He is on the advisory board of the Faculty of Law at the University of Ottawa. In 2021, Ms. Patil was chosen as a board-ready inductee by Women in Capital Markets and the Board List and Canada Board Diversity Council. In 2017, she was a Diversity 50 honoree. Ms. Patil is passionate about capital markets, economic development, education, the environment, and animal welfare. She is a member of the California and Ontario Bars. She earned her ICBD charter from Rotland School of Management and earned her JD and BSc in Statistics and Computer Sciences. And today, today, she graduated from the Innovation Governance Program of the Council of Canadian Innovators. She continues to learn and she continues to amaze. Congratulations on the latest feather in your cap and welcome Priya. Thank you. Uh, and our third panelist is Shreya Patel. Shreya is an actor, writer, director, and mental health advocate. Ms. Patel was recently an honoree of the Top 25 Canadian Immigrant Award and has been named as one of Canada's top 100 most powerful women in the arts, sports, and entertainment category. She has also been identified as an emerging leader under 35. 35, my God. <laughs> Ms. Patel has appeared in lead roles in numerous short films, improv theater productions, and most recently in cast as leading female actor in Strangers in a Room, Vivid and the Intersecting, that explores themes of mental health. Ms. Patel's debut documentary, Girl Up, about domestic human trafficking, was partnered with the Toronto Film International Film Festival and the Civic Action Summit. She'll tell us a little bit more about that later. Ms. Patil's music video directorial debut, Freedom Dance, hit over 12 million views on YouTube, showcasing what inner freedom looks like during a lockdown. You wouldn't have wanted to come to my house. <laughs> the video was reported on by media sources around the world, including Rolling Stone India. During the pandemic, Ms. Patel gathered 66 countries and made a documentary called Unity, hashtag love spreads faster than virus, showcasing the plight of the human spirit, which was the closing film at the Munich Film Festival. Ms. Patel is one of the faces of the Canadian Screen Award winning National Mental Health Awareness Campaign, Bell Let's Talk, raising visibility and breaking the silence around mental health, illness, and support. Congratulations on all your achievements at such a very, very young age and welcome. Thank you. Sharon. Thank you. Uh, as you can see, we've got a, uh, a very, very um, qualified panel and I'm uh, looking forward to hearing what each of these have to say. We're gonna start this evening by posing the following question to each of our panelists. How did you become the person you are? What were your inspirations and drivers? Anju, in the world of aviation, you successfully built teams which propelled cargo jets, digital transformation and growth on a global scale, but you weren't always a titan of industry. What's propelled you to become the person you are today? Who inspired you? What pushed you to reach the position and the success you've had during your storied career? Thanks for that question, Rahul, and thank you for that wonderful um, uh, introduction. Um, you know, um, there's nothing, I, I can't say there's anything in particular that propelled me towards, you know, where I am today, except life, you know, 
life throws you curveballs, you take them, what you do with them. And I was in situations where you either sink or swim, and I chose to splash around and swim. I still don't know how to swim, swim. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I was inspired by my mother, um, who was uh, a working woman. She was a school principal, and her motto was, "If you have life in you, you continue to work hard and have uh, and you and be have extremely good integrity." and you take responsibility and accountability. So there's no such thing as I can't do it. You have the grit, you have to do it. And to this day, I believed in that. That's how I raised my children. And that's how I raised my team. You bring teams together. And my secret to success was that first thing, I usually hired immigrants who other Canadian companies would not hire. Uh, because they had an accent or, you know, I'm a, I'm a techie. So if they couldn't, if they were writing Oracle code in India or in uh, Philippines, they could write the same code here. They didn't need any experience. So I chose to work with people who had the desire and the motivation to succeed. And I supported that. And I created an environment and a culture where it's a safe space to feel welcome to uh, and to challenge people to reach their best. And, and it's not just my success, it's a team effort. You know, everybody who came into my life taught me a lesson. If I didn't get what I wanted, I often wondered, you know, why I did not get there. So um, I think people in general are resilient and everybody wants success. And what's your definition of success what my definition of success may not be the same as for Priya or for Shreya or for yourself or, you know. So success is a very defined, it's a very personal um, personal feature. Uh, some people think, you know, making it to the top and having a Rolls Royce is success. Others think being happy is success. Um, so, you know, um, basically, going through my life and dealing with the ups and downs makes you resilient. You know, you plan for certain things and I'm a, to some degree, I'm a planner. I always have an option. You know, I never quit a job until I had another one lined up, you know, I, like, because I, you have to pay the bills, you know, somewhere in there, <laughs> there is passion and then there's the ability to survive in this world. Unfortunately, everything costs money. So I think financial uh, independence uh, makes women stronger. Thanks for that. That, that was, that was um, wonderful, absolutely wonderful. Priya, both your mother and grandmother before her were strong women and played important roles as you developed from a child into an adult. You left India just prior to college with $500 to your name. You knew not a soul in Canada, but you were prepared to move to a brand new country leaving your family behind. How have these and other experiences shaped you into the person that you are today? Who's inspired you and what continues to drive you forward? Thank you, by the way. It's a pleasure to be here and uh, thank you for the invitation and that great introduction as well. In my life, the most uh, inspiring women have been my mother and grandmother. Uh, both of them were very strong women. And just like Anju, my mother also was an educator. And uh, she was an educator at a time when nobody was even going to school. So she was already ahead of her time. And uh, so was my grandmother. She was managing the family and, you know, uh, assets and stuff, you know, before women were in charge of finances. So I grew up with that type of mindset. I also... And mind you, it was not a bed of roses. You know, there are a lot of you know, uh, you know, challenges. You know that uh, that you face growing up, and uh, you learn to sort of, you know, adjust to situation and try to find a way. And um, that's how it was. Uh, education was very important in our family, and uh, I actually, by the way, I came after I finished my first degree. So. I came to Canada by myself, and there was a lot of reluctance, uh, you know, at the family. We had a small family. I just have one sibling, and uh, my brother and my mom said, you're going there. We don't know anybody there. 
how is it going to work out? But if it doesn't work out, you come back. So that, that one sentence, come back if it doesn't work out, was a big, big wind at my back. So when I got here, when I got here, uh, I knew I could go back. I didn't want to go back. I wanted to make it sort of, you know, make a success. And, you know, I found my way, found my footing. And, you know, there, there are a couple of people that somebody had introduced and they were helpful. And, uh, you know, slowly you build your life, you work, you put some money away, you go to law school. And, you know, it just, you know, doing things, not, not necessarily in a progression that you had envisaged, but just adjusting along the way. It was just like Darwin said, it's not the most intelligent or the strongest that survives. It's the most adaptable. And I'm very adaptable. Agreed. Agreed. Yeah. <laughs> it's it's so, your emotional um, intelligence and your ability to adapt to different situations is what makes us resilient. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Drea, we come to you now at a young age not that you're old now, uh, you immigrated from the Middle East to Canada, and then at the age of 18, you went off to India, and then from Gujarat to Mumbai by yourself. How have those experiences in the past since you were 18 developed you into the person you are today? Who inspired you and what continues to drive you? Well, it has been a very interesting journey for me because yes, like you mentioned, I grew up in the Middle East and I came to Canada when I was 11 and then I went back to India for about four years. The person that inspires me the most is my mother. She's also an artist just like me, but she never thought <laughs> that I would take this up as a career because it's obviously in the arts <laughs> and how do you make money and all these things. So to be very honest, my journey has been filled with just being resilient and really believing, believing in myself. And the thing is, when I'm in Canada, people really tell me that I'm Indian. And when I'm in India, people really tell me that I'm Canadian. So I grew up with a lot of confused identity issues and I had to really find my roots and really had to pay my own path. And the kind of way to find my own roots was when I was in India. So it was, it's been an interesting journey. I, I do have to say, say that like the lifestyle has been really different. I had to come like overcome a lot of inequalities as well at work. and. I had no mentors growing up because no one in my family is in the arts. I did not even know who to look up to. And I think I mentioned this previously when we were talking before that I looked for mentors through YouTube channels because mm -hmm. I didn't know who else could guide me. So I would like look up to people that I really want to by listening to their interviews online and being like, oh, they did this. So maybe I could do it too. <laughs> and literally all of the things that you see me doing now is just me following that path of listening to different people on YouTube channels. Congratulations. We're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're, we're, we're certainly going to, to touch upon the, the mentorship program and uh, again, but uh, I, I found it extraordinary uh, when, when we first spoke that uh, you didn't have a mentor, but you had a virtual mentor and you had many of them. So again, congratulations <laughs> yeah. to you for, for, for what you've done in such a short period of time. And, uh, that was a fantastic answer. Um, each of you uh, come from different areas of the business and arts world. Each of them, whether it be aviation, law, finance, or film, have traditionally been male-oriented, and I would say male-dominated. How have you been able to forge your path through these industries? How have you been able to ensure that your voice is heard? What obstacles have you faced? and What strategies have you employed to address traditional biases against women in these industries? Perhaps I can ask Priya uh, for her thoughts. You know, I'm going to go back to my mom. I have a brother and all the credit to my mom, she never treated us differently, that I was a girl and he was a boy, so I could do this and no, she treated us equally. So even growing up, I was a tomboy, short hair and all that kind of stuff. <laughs> in India. So she never, never, never said that you cannot do this because you're a girl. So that's how I was. So I was actually formed. And when I actually came here, I didn't know I was going to go in the field of law. I knew I would eventually go into finance because that's, I liked that a lot. And I had sort of, you know, a little bit of background in that. The reason I actually went into law, when I came here, I saw there was 
rightly or wrongly, there was a lot of respect for the legal field here. And I looked at it very critically in the sense that what do they actually do, the lawyers? You know, so I looked at the business side of it, the business law, finance law, and I thought these, these professionals are highly respected by businesses. And they are actually innovators of different strategies for business, maybe a financial product, maybe how to run your business, where you go, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought, oh, that's something actually, that's kind of good training. And that's the kind of skill that's, that's transferable to anything, you know, because you learn to think logically in law school and then, you know, you practice and, you know, anyway, so that's why actually I went into law. I did very well and I actually moved to California. So I worked over there and that was probably a very, uh, very, very good experience for me because I was working with a lot of very smart people. You would go to for a drink to a bar and you will see like literally a rocket scientist sitting next to you, talking to you from NASA. So it was really a wonderful experience. So when I came back, I had the opportunity to sort of you know, work you know, with a, a big mining company listed in, you know, both in Canada and the US. Uh, but my heart was in finance. So I was soaking up a lot of stuff. We were doing financings. We were doing all kinds of, you know, different transactions at, at the mining company. I was the right-hand person of the CEO. And once I left the mining company, I got into investment banking. Now, that's a different kettle of fish. It is a completely, law is becoming more women-friendly now. There are a lot of women getting into it. Uh, you know, some of them are even at a very senior level. Investment banking, not so. It is a very, very, very male, male dominated world. And it's not just male dominated, it's also networks oriented world. Who do you know? So if you have come from India as an immigrant, you really don't have the network that somebody who went to, went to Upper Canada College has. So you're facing that kind of resistance because you're trying to sort of pitch a deal, you're trying to get into a deal and all of a sudden the guy across from you, the only reason he gets it is because the CEO is, you know, they went to school together or their fathers, you know, so that kind of network, that was a hard challenge. So it was a, you know, it wasn't a head scratcher. I knew to expect that, but the, how do you actually overcome that? And the only way you can overcome that is by adding value. You actually bring something to the table that they don't have. So here I am, American lawyer, Canadian lawyer, and investment banker. So I would actually throw my legal thing into it. And a lot of, a lot of CEOs actually appreciated that. You know, the boards would appreciate that uh, simply because they knew the kind of advice I would give was going to be within the framework of law and they were not going to be sort of, you know, facing a tough situation. So that's how I actually started to, you know, get into that world. And I have had some terrific clients. I still am friends with them. And, you know, I have had some really wonderful invest, institutional investment clients. And, uh, you know, it was, it was really, really a good run. <laughs> Thank you. That's um, adding value, definitely, definitely something that will get your voice heard. Freya, you made the documentary Girl Off. It's about the difficult topic of human trafficking mm -hmm. and has received many accolades. The context of the question I asked about making your voice heard, what issues have you faced with that particular piece of work and how have you been able to work through and set them aside? Girl Up has been my first documentary that I made right out of like coming out of school. Uh, the reason why I made it was because I found out that girls around me were getting trafficked. Like I heard about that. And it's very different. When you think of trafficking, you think that girls are getting kidnapped and taken into a different country and things like that. That's not the case that happens in Canada. What I found out was 90% of the girls in Ontario have been like kidnapped, not kidnapped. They've been dating this guy that they meet online or through dating apps, and this guy pushes this girl into the sex trade. And no one recognized that as the trafficking, especially in Ontario. So I had to like pick up the camera 
shoot it by myself because no one would give me a grant. No one would support me in this because my background lied in being in the fashion industry before this. So I learned how to pick up a camera. I shot, I edited the whole documentary. I tried to showcase it and twice it was supposed to be in like a small theater and they canceled it last minute. And whenever I would showcase, show it to other people, they would always say that, oh, like this doesn't happen. This is not, this is not trafficking. So for two years, I did not show it to anybody. I took up a nine to five job for the first time in my entire life for one year just to collect money. And I saved up all that money. And then later I self-released the documentary. I quit that job, by the way, on the spot because I didn't need it anymore. <laughs> and I took all that money and I self-released the documentary by myself. And during that time, very few people came, like my friends and a few producers that I was working with before. And one journalist wrote a review about it online. And an MPP in Queens Park, her name is uh, Lori Scott, she found the documentary and she tweeted about it. And I was like, what, how did she find this? So I ended up meeting with her and the documentary, she watched it and things and that helped, she helped pass a bill called Bill C-96, which is a Girl Next Door Act in 2017. And during that time, I was like, okay, well, this is obviously an issue. And now someone in the, in the politics world knows about it. We can create more change. So I extended the documentary by more, like it's 50 minutes now. And that 50 minutes, again, no one wanted to give me money. No one would trust that like someone in the fashion industry is making anything. So again, shot it, shot it, edited it, all of that by myself. And that's the one that kind of uh, blew up in a way that people found out about it. It has showcased all around Canada. A lot of women have watched it. Parents have watched it and they have, they felt like they, it saved their, their kids' lives. I've also had parents, uh, the film was showcased at the TIFF Lightbox once. And the parents that their kids, were, their daughters were getting trafficked at that time were also there seeking help. So uh, we have had some really intense things with it. It was four years before TIFF found reviews about it online themselves and they messaged me to partner with the film and then they showcased it at the Civic Action Summit. And from there, like I got into the Forbes under 30 community and things like that happened, but it took four years before anyone even properly recognized the film. So, so if I were to summarize your journey, especially for Girl Up, it would be, would be perseverance. Yeah. You have to, to, to get your voice heard, you have to persevere. That's, yeah. that's fantastic. And, and, and what an amazing story where there's someone who sees a wrong and that wrong results in a legislative change. I mean, that's that's mm -hmm. extraordinary, extraordinary. Thank you. Anju, I, I read an article on you in the Financial Post where you referred to a situation where you'd been asked by someone to speak at an event. One of your business contacts had asked you. And when you arrived at the function, someone handed you an empty glass to remove, <laughs> making the assumption <laughs> that you were part of the serving staff at the event. Yes. That I would yes. hope is an extreme <laughs> example of bias. That being said, how have you managed to deal with these types of assumptions about who you are and what you are? Um, and how have you managed to make your voice heard? So uh, for me particularly, it's been knowledge, you know? Um, being a woman, being a woman of color right now seems great, but when I first came to Canada, it wasn't so awesome. And those of you who've been here for a long time know the biases that we endured during the 80s and 90s. Mm -hmm. um, but I was in a field, I chose to go into a field um, which was male dominated. And I still get asked questions, you know, um, what do you tell the women who are in male dominated fields? Like, what advice do you have for them? And my response has been, I have no advice for these women. They know what they want. I have a lot of advice for the men because they don't know how to handle the empowered women, right? So <laughs> it takes time. And, and honestly, we are, you know, there's as many men as there's women. It can't be one-sided, right? You, you empower women. And I actually don't like the word, word empower, empower because it implies that somebody else has your power and they're giving it to you. I'm already powerful. That's the attitude you go in with and know your facts, know the subject matter and don't let the men frighten you. 
Uh, don't allow anyone to cut you off, you know, while you're speaking. Speak for yourself. And if you have something to say, say, because nobody is going to come and say, give you a chance. If you have something to say, say it. And if you don't find a seat at this table, then create your own table, you know. And it's been really important to have, you know, we talk about allyship and having men as allies. Um, I've, I've never had a male boss or someone come to me and said, oh, I'm gonna mentor you. And I realized that I had to learn it by myself and I talked to other women and I listened to other people. But what I found in the boardroom was, if, if you are saying something, you have to know your subject. And I'm always the kind of person who has to, like I have antennas 365, 360 degrees, because I, I pick up little nuggets that you need to know to keep the conversation going or to have an example. If I'm recommending something for cybersecurity, I would say this organization or this, um, you know, this company had this kind of situation and this is how they handled it. And you learn from your peers. And you are an, always a learner. You never stop learning. The day you stop learning, you stop growing. In fact, it's a, you know, it's a, when I do other talks, I always, and it's not always Indian people. I, I talk about the story from the Indian mythology and uh, Satish referred to the three goddesses, you know, the goddess of knowledge and the goddess of wealth. So there's a story in mythology that goes around about this young man who wanted to make a lot of money and he wanted to be famous and he wanted to be powerful. So he went to his guru and said, what do I, how do I get there? And the Guruji said to him, listen, you know, in all human beings, these goddesses live in, our, in us. So the goddess of wealth and the goddess of knowledge and wisdom, they're sisters and they have sibling rivalry. So the more you pursue education, the more money is gonna follow you. So I've never really gone after money. Um, I go after knowledge and uh, knowledge is power, right? So knowledge is power. And um, once you acquire the knowledge, money follows you. So success is imminent. And, uh, you know, so some, some of our techniques that we used or our sayings in, in our um, Indian culture and mythology are meaningful. And I choose to use those that, uh, that still serve us, but there are so many other traditions that don't serve us anymore. And I have no hesitancy in dropping those. But being in a male dominated world, uh, you know, I finally joined a board um, where um, the OPG board, which is 11 people out of which six are women, such a pleasure and the dynamics of the organization and diversity, you know, we are not all brown women. We have all kinds of women diversity of thought, diversity um, of um, um, your subject matter, diversity of gender, everything becomes very key, whether you are in a, uh, you know, whether you are, you are a woman or a man in, in a situation like that. So how do you handle the men? You know more than them. That's been my, my way of doing it. <laughs> well, I, I, you know, I, 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 knowledge, value adding and perseverance. Uh, yes. taking away the answers that you gave. Um, diversity on boards is is coming about now. Both, of course, you and uh, Priya are uh, chartered directors. Uh, so we'll hope that we will continue to, um, you know, uh, push, not push the envelope, but turn the page. I think that's a better, better way of putting it. Um, you know, uh, one of my uh, favorite uh, quotes was given to me by my father, and I don't even know if this is actually attributed. It's attributed to Winston Churchill, and he said, "If you're going through hell, keep going." Mm -hmm. And what I'd like to ask you all about is adversity, challenge, and failure. It, it was touched upon in some of your opening remarks, um, but we inevitably face that in a business life. How have you each managed to address? adversity, challenge, and failure? And what have you learned about yourself uh, in those situations? Um, perhaps I can throw it to, uh, to, to, to Shreya first. I think failures make me a better person, to be very honest. When I was younger, because I started like being in the 
fashion industry when I was a teenager, it used to affect me a lot. When you're young, you don't know, you're still learning who you are and all these things. So yes, of course, it would put me down and I would beat myself for it. Like, why didn't this happen? Why did I not go through this? But the more I got older, the more I realized that the, the more lows I get, the more I learn about myself. So if I have a win, I feel like it's, a, it's way more sweeter. And when I started looking at myself as a third person perspective, because I see myself like I'm living in a movie. I feel like I'm in a movie, I'm leading the film and all the characters in the movie has to go through something really terrible or all it's part of life. You go through something all ups and downs, but you learn from them. And the most important thing is to have a positive mindset. And I think that was given to me by my, by my parents. So I have a really growth mindset. So every time something bad happens, my parents are like, okay, well, this happened, but how long are you going to sit in this? <laughs> you got to learn, you got to learn from it. I think it's important to sit in it, but it's also important that you don't victimize yourself for the event that you're going through. And you, it, I've met people that would be like so much older, be like, oh yeah, you know, this happened to me years ago. Yes, that happened to you years ago. <laughs> Let go of it. So I think you have to learn, you have to sit and learn like from that mistake or whatever that happens in your life. And you will make mistakes, but you learn from them, you grow out of it. And I think that makes me like a better person at the end of the day. Anju, what's your view of adversity, challenge, and failure? I think adversity is um, a situation where you have no choice but to get up. You know, when you fall down and you have a failure, there's only two things you can do. One is to say, gosh, I'm never going to try again. And then, or the other option is get up and start trying again. So um, whether it's in your career, whether it's in your personal life, you know, sometimes things that we want, we realize later on, they were not right for us. They were never meant to be. And, and I've always said that I've had I, I have a guardian angel, angel, you know, all the people that I wanted to be with or, you know, what companies I wanted to work with. Because, you know, during adversity is when you have an opportunity to grow, right? because that's when you learn how am I going to survive? How, what is my next step? And you have to think about multiple options. And it's a pure joy to, you know, I look at it as an opportunity, not as a challenge. Okay, so I failed. And now what do I do to get out of it? And I do better than that. Um, the other thing is to have a very supportive environment around you. So my family has been a big strength for me. Uh, my mother particularly was uh, extremely, extremely supporting. Um, and my children, when, you know, when, when my children were little or when they were, um, when, you know, when they were teenagers, my favorite saying is my children have raised me well, you know, so you, they give you a different perspective. Um, they taught me so much about being Canadian and, you know, all the things we talk about now, diversity and inclusion, you know, I wasn't born like that. When I came from India, this, we had these biases, they are inherent in us because we are raised with those books with those uh, biases. So turning the bias, you need to go back to those roots and start raising your boys and girls differently. You know, um, so coming back to how do you get out of adversity is resilience. It's resilience. And you look around you and say, you know, it's never, um, you know, you want to be like more successful, like somebody, you know, who, who is my neighbor or, um, and, and you're not there or you, you fail, what do you, you know, most people know intuitively what they need to do to, to get to where they want to be. So it's not just luck. It's a lot of hard work, perseverance, and willing to go to the very end. And, and there's no shame in asking for help or having a good support system. I personally have what I call my Peabod. Priya, you'll relate to this. It's my personal board of directors. So I have a group of friends. They are my on my board of directors and I am the company. You know, I am the CEO of this company and I have a board of directors around me. I bounce ideas off around them. I have a support system. Uh, you can't do it all alone. You know, it takes a village to raise a kid. It's, it takes people and supportive and understanding and non-judgmental people that make you feel safe is when you can get out of adversity. So resilience, that's how you build resilience. And life is a journey. It's, it can be all smooth because you'll never know 
you know what how, you know what happiness is if you don't know what sadness is so they're all part of the same spectrum and you fall you get up and you look for support and see what you did wrong or or how you can make things better so yeah that's how i came out of my adversity and I'm, i can tell you in my long life i've had a lot of adversity as well but i also have a big support system don't worry you get off you get thrown off the horse and you keep getting back up on the horse <laughs> you have to yeah. otherwise you just lay there on the ground right that's right and you get trampled on and that's no fun i'll ask the same question of you but you know one of the comments that was made earlier on was that women seem to beat themselves up more because they need to be perfect in every way. How, how does that factor into the concept of adversity, challenge, and ultimately failure? And how do you get through all of those things if you've got such a burden on your shoulders of having to be perfect? You see this mug? There is a saying on that. And what it says is, shoot for the moon and you will land among the stars. So I love this mug. <laughs> you know what? The fact, you know, adversity, like failure, adversity is a fact of life. And for any person not to accept that as a part of life, part of your growth, is it's a fund there is a fundamental flaw in that thinking, right? So you know, whatever you want to do, you still like, you know, you know you might fall, you might fail, but you still you know, shoot for that. Now, perfection. If other people are expecting you to be perfect and you're focused on other people, you should examine your own head because nobody's perfect. Are they perfect? People who expect perfection from you, nobody's perfect. So you have to learn to live with your own imperfections and proudly, you know, do not let anybody put you down. Be confident and say, well, he, this is me. I have failed. I have succeeded. And here I am. And I plan to succeed. I might fail, but I plan to succeed. So it just, you know, I mean, I think both Shriya and uh, Anju talked about, you know, it's, it's a mindset. But it's a mindset of, of more uh, confidence in yourself. You know, there is also a bit of spirituality to that recognizing that nothing ever is a straight line. Nobody's life is ever a straight line. And if the only people who have a straight line are dead, <laughs> we are alive. Yeah, we're alive and we are actually going to have all that. And just recognizing that. And, you know, failures come in different forms and shapes. And, you know, some of them are professional, some of them are personal, some of them are your own doing, some of them are other people's doing. <laughs> and then you just sort of learn, it's you, you know, I mean, it's not even a blame game, like because somebody did that, because that doesn't get you anywhere. You know, you say, okay, this happened to me. I'm going to learn something from that and just move on. You know, Bill Gates, he says, success is a lousy, success is a lousy teacher. Because you can, if you're successful all the time, your growth has stunted, period, you know? So, you know, the expectation to be perfect, the expectation to succeed all the time, these are not realistic expectations. And I think we have to live in the reality. Everybody fails. Everybody's imperfect. Just recognize that. Nothing wrong with it. So, so temper your, not expectations, but the, re the realities of what you're trying to accomplish and don't worry about missing the moon if you hit the stars as you would say mm -hmm. keep 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 things positive and uh you know keep going i i like the peabod that you mentioned and years ago years ago i read a book called me inc a little different but a uh, similar sort of concept um you know we're, we're getting very close to the end and i really wish that we weren't but i'm going to ask a couple more questions if, if i might of your time one of the things that we did talk about briefly uh, was um, mentorship. Um, you know, uh, both Anju and, and, and Shreya have mentioned it. You know, um, climbing on the shoulders of those that have come before you to propel yourself forward is, is something that is known. Um, with that in mind, you know, how 
important are mentors to women in business today? And what would one look at and what would one look for um, in a mentor? And, and how would you go about gaining a mentor other than looking on YouTube? So um, I'll go first. Sure. That's okay. So made for you. Question made for you. <laughs> I've been mentoring young people for almost 20 years now. Priya and I were together at Thai and we were mentoring young entrepreneurs how to do their elevator pitch, how to create a business deck, how to write a business plan. But even before that, um, I've, you know, before I went into technology, I was a teacher. And even when I was in technology, I used to teach software. And I had this favorite saying, you know, I used to teach um, uh, SAP and they'd be like mostly all men in my class. And this is the only time men ever listened to me was when I was <laughs> teaching them and they bought every word I said. <laughs> so it was, uh, uh, so, but mentoring um, is important because you have someone, um, it's like your P-Bot pretty much, right? Um, you have someone mentor you and I've had people find me as a mentor um, because, um, you know, they heard about me or they saw something on LinkedIn and people have reached out to me and said, will you mentor me? And, you know, or my, my son's friends, some of them, you know, they, they'll come along. And initially, you know, because I, I think my role um, being, you know, I, being a single mother, I had, you know, I was doing more than my share of raising the kids and, you know, keeping the, uh, the the bacon sorry the vegetarian bacon on the table <laughs> <laughs> but my friends started asking me can you talk to my son about something or you know because I had this ability to create rapport with people and you create that rapport with people because you listen you listen to them and you think about what they're asking you for help so I was mentoring my friends' children, partly because, you know, teenagers don't confide in their mothers, but they can confide in somebody else's mother. And so, you know, that started a long time ago. And, um, it, and it's, I actually feel that my mentees teach me a lot as well. It's not one way street. You know, I, it's not like I'm telling them this is how you should do it. I help them think through their problems and, and see, you know, what alternative options they have. But while I'm doing this, my own brain is working and, and they teach me stuff. So it's a, it's a great learning experience for both the mentor and mentee. But the important thing is to find, define what you need in a mentor. Like, what do you need? Do you need career advice? Do you need to get to the next step in your career? Or do you have, uh, do you need the, the, you know, the educational qualifications to get ahead? And it's helpful. I've had people who've I've done mock interviews with when they were going going for jobs and and giving them options on how to present themselves or you know practices with me and and the last thing I say is before you do anything don't doubt yourself look in the mirror and say I can do it stand <laughs> with it. stand with you know what they call this you know lion pose and say yes I can do it because you have to really bring yourself up and mentoring is like sharing with the next generation. It's my way of giving back. Fabulous. Priya, what's your, what's your view of uh, mentorship? How important is it? And how would you go about finding a mentor? And how do you know you've got the right mentor? You know, I have been fortunate that I have, you know, through the years, I have had mentors of different um, types, you know, I've had people who have encouraged me to you know, pursue a certain career path. I have had mentors who have encouraged me to also uh, add to my education. And, you know, I've had mentors who have said, you know, who have also said, said other things like, you know, okay, in the long run, you have to sort of think about sponsorships. Now, my own experience is that Mentorship and sponsorships are two different stages. Like usually, you know, mentors will last you, you know, in the early stage of your career and probably become a little less uh, impactful as you move, you know, 
higher in your career position. So because when you are sort of, you know, junior, you do need that kind of guidance. And I'm not saying that to put down your mentors or something, you know, it's, it's, it's more respect for them and their time. So if you don't need their time, don't bother them because they're individuals, they have time pressures and, you know, as well. So just be respectful of that. As you actually become senior in your careers, you don't need so much mentors, but you need sponsors. And there's a huge difference between the two. Mentor is guiding you and sponsor is saying, this is the lady you got to promote. This is the lady you got to get on the board. So sponsorship is even more involved. It is literally somebody's lifting you up a little bit, you know, to make you visible. And that I think becomes quite important, especially in board roles. I've been on some public company boards. I've been usually the only woman in the room. Uh, how did I get there? It, you know, somebody mentions you gotta get her on the board. She's got mining, she's got law, she's got finance, you know. And you know, the board actually listens to them and actually gets you on the board. So I think you know, different career uh, stages of career. You, you need mentors or sponsors as you go, you know, go along. But you always have to be respectful of their time. Do not waste their time on stuff you can do on your own. Uh, do not waste their time on stuff that you're clearly unsuitable for. Uh, if tomorrow I ask my sponsor, oh, I want to be the CEO of RBC, I'm not suitable for that. So it's a waste of time and you're going to fall in their eyes. So you got to be practical about it, um, about what your opportunities are and who to go to. I would like to, to, to end this uh, part of the discussion with uh, Shreya only because of your um, very different view of uh, yes. mentorship and how you <laughs> managed to get to where you are. I, 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 and I think it's, it's a millennial thing. Um, and, I, and I'd like you to expand a bit on it. I just loved what Priya just said about like mentorship and then like spons like going to sponsorship. Like that's so interesting to me. I always wanted a mentor. It wasn't like I wasn't seeking one. I just did not know how to get there because growing up, like my family is very supportive, but I had to really prove myself multiple times that I'm able to like carry myself and be financially independent in my arts career. So all throughout my whole career around me, everyone's like, what, what's your what's your job? Like, what's your job? Like, I have a production company. I'm doing this, I'm doing this. It, it was just like really hard. And I just, because you got you get beaten down so much, you don't even know where to search a mentor. And for me earlier, I used to go to YouTube. Every person that I enjoy like listening to, or like I love their graphs, like their career graphs and stuff, I would listen to their interviews online. I would read books and stuff, but mostly it was YouTube. And growing up now, I also, I feel like I'm really young for this, but I do get a lot of messages on LinkedIn to mentor some. I do not mentor everybody, but I do mentor a few, few people. I sit on like this advisory board in India for like Educate India Financial Literacy. So this, this young, he's a 20 year old entrepreneur who's trying to give free financial literacy in like small villages and stuff. And I'm also part of like the WEF, like Global Shapers community and all that stuff. So I, I guide him through that and he's doing that. And then this other girl who is also in Punjab who wants to be in the arts, but same situation. She's really like impact driven and stuff. And she really likes science too, but her parents like going to science. <laughs> so someone <laughs> introduced me to her and I've been mentoring her through it too. So I feel like for me now, because I made my own opportunities, I think like Anju said that too, when they don't give you that that job or that chair, you make your own chair. That has been my career all throughout. I was like- I said the table. When yeah, I, the table. I, I remember that I do need a chair as well. <laughs> we, so we, I think it's the table chair. and chair. We need both. <laughs> we need both. We, we got to have that table and the chair and we got to make our own. And that's been my whole life. And now because of a place that I am and I'm still like starting my journey, but the place I'm in, I have managed to get into like there, there has been opportunities in my film world with Canadian Film Center and Banff and stuff opening up like women's accelerator programs for women in media business. So I finally have gotten in those and they're, they're helping us get mentors who are like older than me who are already successful in that. So finally, I will be getting a mentor this year. And I'm really excited about that. So I, thank you. And I feel like only in the last few years that these, these incubators have happened 
So I'm really excited to finally meet someone that I really always wanted to. You know, I was on the board of DMZ and it we would do a lot of mentorships to incubate. And actually, it's fun because even if it's not something that you can see yourself doing in a you know long run, it's just how people think and people bring up you know ideas to the table. And sometimes you have your you know commercial uh, head on your shoulders and you say, well, maybe it won't work. But it doesn't matter. The fact is they're bringing it, and one of them or a few of them are going to be very successful. Mm -hmm. Right? Yeah, so, I agree. Yeah, but I do agree with Priya when uh, she talked about sponsorship. You need people who will advocate for you. And that's, that's clearly, you know, very important. Um, but if you are in a position to mentor, you help people, yeah. women, men, you know, help raise each other. Um, there's room for everybody in this world to be successful. Mm -hmm. what, a, what a lovely thought to end this program on. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Sunita and Ritesh, are there any questions from the audience uh, that have come up? I haven't seen any. I think well, everyone's been just, uh, just in, in, oh, absolutely, and just enraptured by what they've heard today. Um, I really would like to thank each of you, Anju, Priya, Shreya, for a robust and highly informative discussion. I, I thank you for the time that you've taken out of your, your evenings to spend with us. I am sure that uh, some of what you said will resonate on many of the people that are listening today. And it's been an absolute pleasure, absolute pleasure. I thank you all for joining us today that, that have been watching. And I'm going to now uh, turn uh, the screen over to uh, Mr. Ritesh Malik, uh, Canada India Foundation's national convener to give a final vote of thanks. Ritesh. Uh, thank you so much, Rahul. Uh, good evening, everyone. What an excellent discussion today with such great heartwarming experiences shared by our wonderful panelists. As Rahul said, we wanted this to go on and on. <laughs> After listening to all our panelists and special guests today, it is clear that CIF's International Women's Day is gaining in strength and has the potential to grow into a leading event on behalf of women's equality. It is my special honor today to thank, thank the participants who contributed so much of their time and shared their thoughts with us and the online audience. I will start with India's Consul General in Toronto, Mr. Purva Srivastavji, an accomplished woman herself and a continuous source of inspiration for us at CIF. Thank you, Apurvaji. And of course, the panelists, as you have learned today, already each one a shining example of how hard work, dedication, determination, and decisions with talent and ambition can help propel women to the very top. Thank you, Anju Vermani ji, Priya Patil ji, and Shriya Patel ji for your active participation today. It was a great learning experience to listen as you explained the challenges faced by women today. You also gave us reasons to hope that the future is women friendly. Thank you. A special thank you to Rahul Shastri, a member of the CIF Board of Governors and our past national convener for moderating the session. Only a man with plenty of empathy for the cause of women could have done such a wonderful job. Thank you, Rahul ji. Friends, tomorrow morning at 9 a.m., we are also doing another virtual event on exploring business and investment opportunities between India and the city of Barrie. We invite you to please register and join to get more information on India growth story and how it can help you in promoting your business here in municipalities outside GTA, such as city of Barrie. Thank you. Have a good evening. Namaste.